Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Crown Castle International Corporation, ticker CCI. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. This company has a market cap of $73 billion, enterprise value of $94 billion, so you can already see there's a lot of debt on this business, and it appears that, that is because it is a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. Real estate companies are known for having heavy debt leverage, and so we should see a very leveraged business in our analysis. Now, business description. They own operate and lease more than 40,000 cell towers and 80,000 route miles of fiber, supporting small cells and fiber solutions across the U.S. markets. So communication infrastructure, cities, communities, essential data. So sounds like a pretty good business. Cell towers and fiber, of course, are going to be very high in demand. You should expect very high um, payment rates on these infrastructure projects. So it should look good from that standpoint. From a beta standpoint, things look like a relatively high quality. This is a very low share turnover and low beta for an S&P 500 company. Beta of one would be normal for an S&P 500 company. And the closer share turnover is below 100%, the better tends to be a sign of a high quality. Now, where that changes is when I look at this return on invested capital chart. What I like to see is 20 straight years of profitability, and barring that, 19 straight years of profitability, or 19 years of profitability out of every 20. Now they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years of losses in the last 20 years with 12 years of profits. Now, what's interesting though is they have 11 straight years of profits over the last 11 years, and they haven't had a loss since 2010. But before 2010, they seem to have a lot of losses. Now, what this signals to me is that the business has changed. Um, this looks like startup costs. This looks like a lot of expenses with building out the infrastructure, and especially in a fiber business. Fiber would have been relatively new, certainly in 2002, um, in these time frames. And so building out the kind of wireless market, the fiber market, this looks like startup conditions. And you've seen improving conditions since then and very, very stable numbers since then as well. So presumably the last 10 years is probably a better sign than the previous 10 years. So I can forgive them for the results that I'm seeing here. When we look at it in that sense, it's like, okay, now we can say, okay, we have the stability of a high quality company. But what I don't like is the return on capital, capital is just very, very low. You see a high point of 8% in 2015. But if I had to guess when we dive in deeper, there's going to be a one-time um, income here that's that's being calculated and not really part of it. So really what I see is that return on invested capital has peaked at 3% so far. Now it might be improving over time, but it's only at 3%. And that is very, very low. It's very hard to get a return on equity of 15% when your return on invested capital is only 3%. And you're going to be capped on your returns based upon what your returns on capital are. And so that's a problem because it means in order to grow, you're going to be taking on a lot of debt. You're just not getting the returns in order to justify it. So you need substantial leverage and you need interest costs below your return on invested capital if you really want that to be successful for you over the long term. So signs of quality, but also very signs of a bad business. Bad business typically has low returns on invested capital, and that's what we're seeing here. And where it's backed up by this 10-year median returns, you see return on assets 2%, return on invested capital 2%, return on equity 6%. Now, the difference between 6% here and 2% here is that leverage. The leverage of the REIT is giving you that boost, but it's simply not enough. What's crazy though is you have very high gross profit margins, 65% gross profit margins, 23% free cash flow margins, and yet you have pretty poor return on invested capital. Now, you do have a, t a gap here. So you have 10% pre-tax income, 23% free cash flow. So what that's telling me is that your returns on cash are much better than your returns on earnings. Your, and so, you know, what we could do generously is just double this number, right? So we say, okay, let's say it's twice as big. So instead of 2% um, return on invested capital, it's actually 4%. Instead of 6% return on equity, maybe it's 12%. Now it's getting more respectable when you start looking at those cash numbers. Um, but again, it's just very, very low. Now, what we can see is if we did that just for the last year, you start to get some attractive numbers because you say, okay, return on invested capital for the last year is 12%. You double that, maybe you're at 24. Um, you double that return on invested capital from 3% to 6%. Maybe that is starting to be attractive when you think of this on a cash basis. So on a cash basis, you're starting to get a little bit more attractive. That's not uncommon for a REIT, but it's something to be aware of. Now, 
Valuation just seems ridiculous. A PE of 47. So unless there's something weird in the most recent year, which there isn't, it looks like it's a pretty normal progression of earnings. Again, with this weird number in 2015, which we'll investigate. Um, that That's just a ridiculously high PE. Price to sales above 10 extremely overvalued there you can you cannot justify paying more than 10 times sales for a company and expect that to work out for you it's just simply too high of a price and think about that you're paying 11 times sales basically for a company with poor returns on equity poor returns on capital you're probably doing it just because of this revenue growth um, double digit 12 percent revenue growth 17 percent eps growth yes it looks really attractive but it's dangerous. You can lose a lot of money buying companies like this. This looks like, based upon the numbers, a low quality company at a very, very high valuation. We'll see if that holds true as we dive deeper into the financial statements. But before we do that, don't forget to like this video, hit that subscribe button so you can get more videos as I upload new videos each and every week, three videos, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're working through every company in the SP 500. We have already done well over a hundred of the 500 companies in the SP 500. And so we're going to have a link to the playlist at the end of this video. But again, dive on in, hit that subscribe button, your likes and subscribes help support the channel, help me grow and let the YouTube algorithm know you're enjoying my content. So let's dive on a little bit deeper and get an understanding. First thing I wanna know is 2015. What happened with this EPS? So let's go to the income statement. Why am I not logged in? So we are on the income statement now and let's dive into 2015 to get a better idea of what's going on here. Um, Let's see, is there some sort of one-time number that gives them a massive boost? Um, it is not obvious. It's really weird. So um, something is going on with my data because it's showing pre-tax income of $474 million here, and yet net income is one5 and there's nothing on here that suggests what that is. So I'm just going to assume the 2015 number is not showing up correctly. Um, it's showing that the net income is higher than operating profit, which tells me all I need to know that the number is basically made up. Um, so we're going to ignore 2015 and just say it's basically in line with 2014 and 2015, 2016. <laughs> now, one thing that you see with these poor quality companies is, is you see massive dilution. Look at this. You've gone from 291 million shares outstanding to 434 million shares outstanding. So that's like a 40% increase in shares outstanding over the course of decades. So you've been diluting at four or five percent per year, um, or three to five percent um, dilution per year, which gives you lower returns than actually you're going to be reporting. So I mean, when you think about this revenue growth of 12%, you need to subtract, you know, three to five percent of your returns because of that. Now, really, what you care about is this EPS. But again, you're being constantly diluted. There's no change in the capital allocation here. You're just dilution, 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 dilution. It's pretty constant. It's not a one-time change. They're just, it's part of the business plan. So when you're projecting forward, you need a plan on three to 5% lower returns than what the business is going to give you because that is what management is choosing. It's the only way they can fund this business, by the way. You can't possibly grow your EPS faster than your returns on capital because for for a permanent amount of time there's things that you can do to do it but you have to dilute or you have to raise debt in order to do it because the business cannot generate the internal capital in order to pull that off now balance sheet what you can see is you're also increasing your assets quite significantly you've basically five extra assets from five billion or four to five x let's call it four x to be a little um generous um, you've taken your long-term debt from 6.8 billion to 20 billion. You're basically covering all of your PP&E with long-term debt. In addition, you can see that they had some acquisitions in here because they've taken goodwill from 2 billion to 10 billion. So there's 8 billion in acquisitions there. There's 2 billion in acquisitions here. So you're having an additional, you know, you four X again, you've gone from 10 billion in assets to 39 billion in assets. All of that is extra assets needing to provide this income. So what do we said? We took I'm going to ignore this trailing 12 months numbers because something weird is happening here. Um, but let's call it, just take this one. And so again, you're at, you know, 11 billion or 1.1 billion in earnings. You're at 200 million in earnings. So you're up 5x 
Um, so 5x in income, 5x in assets, you're about in that range. There's a little bit of operating leverage, leverage there. And that operating leverage is showing up again in this Kager while your EPS is growing faster than your revenue. But again, you're growing assets very quickly. 14% asset growth is very dangerous. The faster you grow your assets, the more risk there is in the business. Because what it's going to do is those assets have costs. Those costs are going to show up in depreciation or which is our cash flow statement. So here's the big gap here. You have very high cash flow from operations, but you're using up a significant amount on depreciation. One of the things you have to think about and that's always worrying with real estate type companies is that these depreciation numbers can sometimes cause you to underestimate the future expenses. A lot of times what happens with many companies is that the amount that you depreciate, the amount that you're spending on CapEx, because inflation exists, causes you to have higher future expenses than you're planning for. Depreciation is not meant to cover future costs. It's meant to amortize past costs. And so you're taking past costs, you're putting it out, but let's say you spend a billion dollars on CapEx and you're going to depreciate off a billion dollars over a 10 year period. When you actually replace it in 10 years, it might cost cost you two and a half billion. And so you've under planned for what that is. The depreciation doesn't cover your future costs. It's just an accounting metric. So you need to think about this and say, okay, some people like to say, okay, yeah, you had net income of 1.1 billion in 2021, but you had cash flow from operations of 2.7 billion. So this is the number that matters and all this depreciation is fake. That's not true. It's a lot more conservative to value this business off of net income. When you value it off of cash, you're liable to have problems because you're basically saying that this isn't a real cost. So it's very dangerous to ignore the depreciation and amortization because the whole business model is designed around that. Now, you have to do that if you're going to be buying this company because if you don't, you, you it's the only way to justify a PE of this big is because basically you're saying, oh, I'm not actually paying a PE of 47. I'm paying, you know, EV to EBITDA of 23. You know, it's, it's half the price because I'm really worried about cash. But that cash isn't real. It includes a lot of depreciation. It includes a lot of costs here like that you're actually spending. You are spending money on PP&E each and every year. You are spending money temporarily on some big acquisitions, 8.8 billion, 4.9 billion, 9.2 billion. And the company can't re achieve this growth unless you repeat that in the future. And the problem is, is you're going to be doing that with debt. You can't fund it with cash from the business because we've already proven that. Look, you're raising debt here. You're raising debt here. Every year you're taking on more and more debt. In addition, you're issuing stock all the time. And so you think about this and they're substantially doing this over and over again. Also, look at how this is set up. They're paying out your dividends, substantially exceeding your earnings. Now, granted, cash pays cash dividends. So again, you have cash here, you have the cash to do it. But what you don't do is you don't have the cash flow from operations to fund both your dividend and your investing without taking on more debt. So they can't do both their investment and the dividend without taking on more debt. They're having to constantly finance basically their dividend. Now you can basically claim, are you financing your dividend? Are you financing your growth? That's up to you. But you need to be aware of what this business is doing. These costs are very, very real. And so when you see something like dividends, twice the number of your net income, that one way to think about that is that as a payout ratio of 200%, and the only way you pull that off is raising debt, and issuing more equity, which is why they're diluting you. So it's not a good setup for long-term return. This is a company that I would avoid because they're playing fast and loose with shareholder money. They're taking a very leveraged approach to growing the business. They're not growing it with internally generated cash flows. They're growing it with other people's money, including yours. They're diluting you. And that's something that I would avoid. It's not something that I am interested in. I like to own companies that are buying back shares, not issuing shares. I like to own companies that internally generate cash flow and not having to pull on more and more debt all the time. You see the opposite with this company, so I would pass on Crown Castle International. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. I need your likes on each and every video because that tells YouTube that you're enjoying my content. And if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. I'm working through every company in SP 500. If you'd like to see my past ones, I have the playlist coming up here at the top where you can look at the playlist for the SP 500 companies I've covered so far. It's already over 100 companies looking at S&P 500 companies doing reviews like this.
If you like this style of review and you want to use the software yourself, you can go to quickfs.net through my link in the description. If you use that link, that is my affiliate link, so I could receive a commission if you ever choose to sign up, create an account, which I recommend. I find that this is a very useful tool for myself. I don't recommend anything that I don't use myself, and this is a tool that I enjoy using just like this to do my analysis. So thank you for listening, and until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.